Welcome back, everybody, to episode 47 of the Quantum Science Seminar, which today will be all about quantum optics, but with molecules. And uh, as usual, we would like to have your questions. So please send us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com, or you could use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of your screen. As usual, please note that there is a 30 second time delay when you ask your questions, because that's a 30 second delay between what we do here and what YouTube uh, is showing as live. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Costanza, who will introduce our speaker today. So good afternoon to everyone. It is today my sincere pleasure to welcome Vahid Sandogdar on the Quantum Science Seminar stage. Vahid has studied and worked in three different continents and roughly 10 countries before settling down, for the moment I should say, in Germany, where he is currently director at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. He did his high school in Tehran at the National Center for Talented Students, then moved to the University of California in Davis for his bachelor and to Yale for the master degree. He graduated with a thesis in atomic physics under the supervision of Ed Heinz and Serge Roche, with whom Vahid also worked as a postdoc, adding cavity quantum electrodynamics and photonics to his background. Then he became a group leader and founder of the nano-optics group in Constance, where he started working on single molecules as nanoprobes and emitters. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Then about five years later, he was appointed full professor at, ET, at the ETH in Zurich, where the nano-optics group became even more successful and expanded quite a bit. I was a very good friend those days of a PhD student whose mission was the detection of a single ion in the solid state. And yes, the group succeeded in that challenge as well. So Vahid started investigating also biophysics question those days, which animate part of Vahid's division today as well. Talking about prizes, I will only mention the ERC advance grant and the Humboldt professorship, because I guess that they are enough to give you the idea about the track record. So now Vahid, we really look forward to hearing about new results and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Costanzo. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for the invitation. Thanks very much for uh, the very warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. As Costanzo uh, said, we've been uh, uh, doing different things over the years. Uh, and the story that I'm going to tell you is something that has really grown for over more than uh, 20 years. And uh, uh, today, you can call that something like molecular uh, quantum uh, optics. Uh, so uh, let me start by, uh, um, by getting my screen activated. Why does it not work now? Oh, there, finally. Okay, so now it's working. Uh, sorry about that. So yeah, so I'd like to start by uh, thanking the people who are working with me in uh, the you know, our quantum optics branch, as Costanza said, about half of our group does biophysics, and I'm not going to uh, talk about that today. So the people uh, involved in the type of work that I tell you about today. Uh, um, there are uh, three uh, wonderful staff scientists, including uh, uh, Stefan Götzinger, who's actually a professor at the university in Erlangen. Uh, and then uh, we have postdocs and uh, uh, a number of uh, excellent PhD students. And uh, uh, so right now we're actually uh, looking for uh, more postdocs. So if you find this work interesting, please do feel free to uh, get in touch with me. Um, so let me uh, uh, get to a very kind of fundamental question that uh, was, uh, in a way, uh, not necessarily a quantum optical question in, in its uh, most mainstream sense, but it's a question that was a very basic question that moved us to uh, do many of the experiments that have grown to be what they are today, uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, the question is, what happens if you send a photon onto a single uh, two-level atom? Uh, now, in your quantum mechanics course, uh, you uh, uh, usually say, okay, I need a Hamiltonian. You write your Hamiltonian. You know that, okay, the interaction has to do with the electric field and the dipole transition. And once you have this Hamiltonian, you can do all kinds of 
uh, calculations about what happens to your atom. Um, I uh, would like to uh, uh, give you a slightly different uh, equivalent approach, um, which is uh, uh, to start maybe a little hand-waving or, uh, or less quantum mechanical looking. Uh, but uh, of course, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence and it's just a, it's a, it's a different picture maybe, but it's a very powerful picture, I think, uh, in terms of understanding a lot of uh, 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 basic uh, light matter interaction processes. And uh, in this picture, um, I very much rely on the concept of a cross-section. Uh, so imagine that you have a piece of matter that could be a single atom, but it could also be a nanoparticle. Uh, you illuminate it. And uh, of course, uh, uh, there are two fundamental uh, processes that happen. Uh, one is a scattering and the other one is absorption. In the case of a two-level atom, of course, you don't really have absorption because everything that is uh, absorbed is also re-emitted or uh, scattered. Um, but in general, this is what you would write. Either way, you're taking some light out of the uh, incoming beam. So if you were to look right uh, into the beam in transmission, you put your detector there, uh, then you would see uh, a shadow, okay? And uh, this shadow has to do with the fact that some light is taken out. And the amount of light that uh, had to do with the interaction with that uh, object can be written as the incident hour times uh, some cross-section divided by area A, which would be the area of the light uh, here. So this is something that uh, you know, one learns maybe even in high school or in, in, uh, in first year of physics. Um, but uh, it becomes interesting if you ask the question, what is sigma now for a two-level system for, for an atom? Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure everyone has uh, seen this at some point, but it might be that you've forgotten that or you don't think about this uh, consciously on a daily basis. But if you're uh, doing nano optics, this becomes a very central uh, concept for you. Uh, because you're usually interested in issues of resolution, you're interested in issues of size, and here you see that the cross-section, the optical cross-section of, of an atom, is actually quite large of the order of lambda squared divided by two. So of course it's not, uh, it's not surprising that it has nothing to do with the physical size of the atom, uh, but uh, what is impressive is that it is as large as a wavelength. And it's, uh, that point is important because of course you know that uh, A can be easily uh, uh, minimized uh, to the size of something like a wavelength if you were to focus your light very tightly, which means that sigma over A uh, should be, uh, 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 it, it should be possible to get it as large as something of the order of one. And that would mean that a single atom should put a complete shadow uh, if you uh, look through it. Um, now, if you look a little more, then you see that the story is a little more complicated because your atom is never uh, as pure as you would want it. Uh, in particular, if you're working in the, in the solid state, as we do, um, your emitter is going to be uh, embedded in some kind of a matrix. And uh, the moment you embed your emitter in some kind of a matrix, it couples to uh, all kinds of phononic modes uh, in its environment. So you can think about all the atoms and molecules in the environment jittering, and all of that uh, ends up uh, creating a uh, dephasing um, for the transition of the atom. And uh, what you have to then, what you then have is that the cross section is reduced by this factor where gamma zero would be your spontaneous emission rate and gamma would be uh, the overall line width that you have. So that would be uh, the sum of the radiative or spontaneous emission rate. Uh, there might be non-radiative decays, uh, but usually there is a strong uh, dephasing. And uh, in fact, at room temperature, uh, this dephasing, which is essentially what you would call decoherence, uh, is, uh, is huge. It's of the order of 100,000 times larger than the spontaneous emission, which means that this factor here is of the order of 10 to minus 5 or 10 to minus 6. If you were to look at something like a quantum dot or a molecule or color center, 
uh, in a dielectric at room temperature. Um, but if you go to low temperatures uh, and you have the right system, uh, then you can manage to reduce this factor, gamma zero divided by gamma, uh, or, or increase this factor, excuse me, uh, all the way to something of the order of uh, one. And this is uh, what you can do if you were to work with uh, a molecule like dibenzoterylene. Uh, uh, for those who are not very familiar with molecular system, you can think of this as um, a piece of uh, small piece of uh, graphene that you've very carefully cut out, and uh, then uh, all these corners are passivated with hydrogen. So a whole bunch of carbon atoms and a whole bunch of hydrogen atoms around it, nothing else. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a rigid planar system, and then you embed that in a matrix that is made of uh, something else that uh, looks like graphene, and that would be in this case anthracene. Um, what you see here in this picture is a, is a contour of an anthracene crystal, and when I uh, run the movie, you will see individual molecules light up. Those are the individual DBT molecules lighting up in this uh, crystal. The structure, uh, uh, level structure of the DBT molecule is quite similar to any other type of dye molecule, um, uh, which means that you have to remember that you have your electronic ground state and electronic excited state, but you also always are aware that you have vibrational states. Uh, these vibrational states are actually a great resource, uh, except that usually, because they decay very fast in the solid state, uh, it, they, it, it results in these decay channels uh, being extremely uh, low in coherence. So the lifetime of these states is typically of the order of a picosecond. But uh, uh, the transition from uh, the excited state to the ground state uh, is nevertheless very strong, the so-called zero phonon line. And uh, I will say more about that. Uh, so uh, anyhow, what you, when you excite the system, you have access to redshifted fluorescence molecules that come like this. And then you would have access to uh, photons that are scattered um, at the same wavelength by uh, the molecule. So uh, uh, the, the scheme is quite similar. This is something that was uh, developed uh, more than 30 years ago. Uh, and the idea is that you scan your laser frequency through the inhomogeneous distribution of the resonances of the individual molecules in there. So although all molecules are nominally the same, uh, they see slightly different local environments, which means that the resonance frequencies are a little uh, uh, spread. And that's the thing that gives us the possibility to talk to one molecule uh, at a time. And as you uh, saw uh, here, uh, at different times, different molecules light up because each one of them is resonant at a different frequency. Um, so if you were to zoom into one of these resonances, uh, uh, you would see that this resonance could be as narrow as uh, something of the order of 10 to 50 megahertz, depending on the molecule that you have. Uh, here I'm showing you two resonances, one detected in fluorescence, so that's a positive signal. Uh, so you only get a photon when you have excited your molecule and that molecule has emitted fluorescence. Uh, and then there is a, another way of detecting the molecule, that's if you want in extinction or absorption. Uh, that's where you're looking at the same wavelength as the incident beam. Uh, and uh, you're doing that shadow experiment that I uh, uh, told you about. Except that here uh, uh, we have uh, only a few percent, and I will say something about why uh, that is in a little bit. What's important for you to realize if you're not familiar with molecules is that the line width that you have here, uh, this let's say 10, 20 megahertz, is really the Fourier limit that you get from uh, the excited state lifetime of uh, a few nanoseconds. Uh, important is that although you have a molecule that is in a solid state embedded in a crystal, uh, at something like one and a half Kelvin, you manage to decouple it from uh, the environment. So you really have a, a wonderful quantum coherence for uh, uh, this, um, uh, this molecule. Um, 
So the, the way you would do this experiment ends up being uh, quite straightforward. Um, it is technologically a little challenging, but uh, conceptually extremely straightforward. Conceptually, all you have to do is you have to focus your light onto a single molecule and look in transmission, and then you can show that you can get dips of the order of uh, 10, 20% from one single molecule. Uh, these are a number of uh, uh, papers that we've published over the years, every time uh, really taking advantage of the fact that uh, in this type of arrangement, uh, the interaction of an incoming beam and a single molecule is so efficient uh, that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can do experiments like uh, showing uh, a phase, the change of phase of a laser beam because of a single molecule or uh, doing two photon interference experiments and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so again, I won't go into uh, to the technical details, but basically we're operating uh, a cryostat at about one and a half Kelvin. And, uh, 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 and, and at that temperature, the system of uh, uh, molecules and matrix have become very well behaved so that this factor here becomes of the order of one your cross-section becomes very large. Um, but you notice that I've been talking about a few percent or maybe 10, 20% dip, but I told you in the beginning that it should be possible to extinguish uh, the incoming light completely. Uh, the reason it doesn't happen is mostly because your molecule is actually not a tool system. Uh, we went through this already. Uh, it turns out that about 30% of the uh, juice is in the zero phonon line, and the rest of it is, if you want, wasted by going through uh, these vibrational states. And because the vibrational states decohere very fast, um, your scattering cross-section is uh, reduced. Um, so uh, we can express that with something like a branching ratio alpha that we just, as a fudge factor, we put in front. Um, uh, in practice, we're also not focusing perfectly, so there's also a little bit that we lose there. Either way, the fact is that um, in reality, uh, this molecule is not going to manage to have a 100% efficiency of interaction with an incoming uh, photon. Incidentally, that's exactly the same thing if you were to look at a single rubidium atom. Uh, you would have to uh, uh, walk this into a closed transition, otherwise, uh, uh, you have lots of decay channels and therefore the cross-section is reduced. And if you're looking at a quantum dot or color center, in every case, uh, there are always reasons why this cross-section is actually somewhat reduced. And that's why we and uh, uh, many other people in this type of uh, solid state quantum optics are interested in enhancing uh, this transition here by putting the molecule in a cavity. And the idea is uh, fairly straightforward. You enhance this transition. And uh, if you were to enhance that by a factor of 10, uh, then instead of having, let's say, only 30% coming down here, you would get up to something of the order of 90% coming down here. And uh, the contributions that of, of the transitions going uh, the wrong way uh, become uh, asymptotically uh, negligible. Um, so cavity QED is in this community, I'm sure, uh, very well known, but uh, the way I'd like to think about it uh, is to kind of drag my cross-section uh, analogy uh, further into the cavity. And the idea is that if I have an atom and I send the photon uh, through it, the photon is going to uh, bounce, uh, uh, go through the, uh, uh, or bounce off the atom once. And the first time it's going to, uh, its probability of bouncing is going to be sigma over A, uh, where A is the beam waste in the cavity now. But in the cavity, the photon gets uh, uh, circulated many times, essentially by something like finesse divided by pi. And uh, that means that the figure of merit for the enhancement is going to be the finesse divided by A. Compared to my uh, focusing experiment that I had before, I'm losing because uh, in the cavity, my beam waste is typically considerably larger than a diffraction limit of focus. Uh, but I win because I have a certain finesse. And uh, if uh, you were to manipulate this uh, uh, factor f by a, you could easily show that that's basically the same thing as q over v. 
which is uh, uh, the perhaps more common way of expressing the Purcell factor. And uh, you could also show that it's essentially the same thing as the cooperativity factor, uh, where uh, uh, G and kappa and gamma are the uh, usual parameters that you'd be used to. Either way, what you would like to do uh, uh, is to uh, uh, enhance this uh, transition as much as possible. For that, you would want to uh, have a large Q or a small mode volume, uh, except that, uh, so in, 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 in atomic physics, typically people have gone for very large Qs, uh, but their micro cavities uh, have volumes that are not so small. Um, we're interested in keeping Q as low as possible for several reasons. One is technical because we're operating everything in a cryostat, so uh, uh, a Q that is too high is, uh, is, is a challenge. Uh, uh, but also because a lower Q means larger bandwidth, and that makes the uh, whole situation it's a, lot, uh, a lot more interesting. So we, when we started this experiment, actually, uh, this uh, was in the very beginning. The very first steps was, uh, was taken by uh, Constanza while uh, we were still in Zurich. Uh, and uh, we insisted on wanting to make a cavity uh, that is very small. So we wanted to make V as small as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, over the years, we've uh, learned to uh, use focus ion beam milling uh, for making uh, very uh, small curvature mirrors because if the mirror is has a very small curvature, we can bring it very close to another mirror, which we choose uh, to uh, be flat. Uh, and, and therefore, the mode volume can become very small. So uh, we typically take a flake of anthracene and put it uh, on a uh, on a flat mirror. This anthracene would be doped with uh, something like a DBT molecule. And now we have the great advantage that we can uh, move the one mirror against the other one, uh, but also tune the resonance frequency by moving it in this direction. Uh, we usually put this uh, highly curved mirror at the end of an AFM tip or at the end of a fiber tip. And uh, again, that gives us the possibility to scan the whole thing. Then once you've fabricated your mirror, you have to send it to be, for it to be coated. Uh, this is an example of a 12 layer coating. And uh, when you do that, you get a very high reflectivity and uh, you have a nice uh, cavity. This cavity is assembled in a cryostat uh, using a standard slipstick type of motors. Uh, but you need quite a few of them, and of course, that means that you have lots of degrees of freedom and uh, possibilities of vibrations and drifts, and those are the things that you have to work on if you want to get a stable cavity. Again, those are technical details. Here I'm showing you a, an a image, an optical microscope image of some of these uh, anthracene crystals. So you see that they could be a few tens of microns uh, uh, large, and uh, uh, when we put them in the microscope, in the cavity, uh, we go for fairly thin ones that are only a few hundred nanometers uh, thick. All right, uh, so this is basically it. This is the way uh, uh, you do the experiment. It's all very straightforward, and uh, I'm just going to show you some results. Uh, this is the kind of signal that we get from an empty, a so-called empty cavity. Of course, the cavity is not empty. The crystal is in there, but we've tuned the cavity away from any of the molecular resonances. And uh, in this case, the transmission looks like a peak and the reflection like a dip, as, uh, as you would expect. And now we're going to tune the resonance of the cavity to one of the molecules. And when they become resonant with each other, you see that a single molecule is putting a large dent on the signal of the cavity. Uh, in a hand-waving way, the molecule is changing the uh, index of refraction of the cavity enough uh, for it to be completely uh, detuned. So where you had resonance, uh, you no longer uh, have a resonance. Um, because we have, a, uh, have an open cavity, we have the luxury of being able to look at the same molecule with and without the cavity. And here you see that the resonance of the molecule is indeed uh, uh, quite narrow, uh, in this case about 40 megahertz when it's not resonant with the cavity. And when we make it resonant with the cavity, that same molecule uh, gives us a width of uh, more than 600 megahertz. 
And uh, uh, so that way you, we can analyze uh, our data and extract the Purcell factor that is of the order of uh, 40 in this case. And uh, the Q that we get uh, uh, is of the order of uh, 140,000, so a respectively high Q, but not uh, amazing Q of a million or 10 million or something like that. All right. Uh, now, one of the things that happens, uh, of course, is that when you have a situation uh, like this, uh, uh, you're showing that a single molecule is blocking a beam of uh, photons. And uh, of course, we're now operating in a regime where the molecule is not saturated. And um, uh, uh, so the system is responding very uh, sensitively to uh, individual photons, but a laser beam is a, uh, is a Poisson, has a Poisson statistics, which means that uh, you don't only have single photons, but you also sometimes have no photon or uh, two photons. And uh, uh, what you can then show is that if you were to look at the light that is transmitted through the cavity, that is at this frequency, it's not a lot of light, but if you look at the light that is transmitted, uh, then you see that that light is actually very strongly bunched. Uh, and it's bunched because we have kicked out essentially uh, uh, the single photon components uh, out of this uh, statistical mixture. Uh, so this is a nice uh, example or signature that the system is actually very highly uh, nonlinear. Um, but the morale of the story is that at this point, we have uh, essentially turned something that is more complicated uh, and has the coherence channels. We have forced it to act like a tool of a system and uh, interact with incoming photons very efficiently. All right, and, and of course, uh, again, I emphasize that uh, uh, we're doing this with, um, with molecules, but there are uh, uh, several groups that are uh, uh, doing this type of work with quantum dots or color centers or ions. Uh, it's always the same, uh, the same logic. And uh, here, I guess, I'm trying to uh, particularly emphasize that organic molecules, although you might not think of them as good quantum emitters, actually turn out to be uh, really good uh, quantum emitters. Um, now, we went a step further when we were doing that experiment and said that, well, you know, we talk about a single photon interacting with a single molecule, let's just really demonstrate that. Uh, so to have access to single photons instead of a laser beam, uh, we need uh, essentially a second molecule, right? Or a second quantum emitter. But the simplest thing is to take another DBT molecule and make it emit, uh, put that emission into a fiber and bring it to the cavity that uh, hosts uh, our uh, other molecule. Um, so uh, the way we do this, we couple two uh, cryostat experiments. Uh, one is the experiment that I just have been telling you about. And then in the other experiment, we uh, really do a very simple thing. Uh, we uh, scan the sample, uh, we find molecules, we find a molecule that is, has a transition frequency that is fairly close to where we want to be. Uh, uh, and, uh, but then we have microelectrodes around it. Uh, so that we can tune the frequency uh, of emission to be exactly the same as the uh, frequency of the molecule that is in the cavity. Um, and now you can excite this molecule in a slightly different way. You pump to higher levels and, uh, and then collect the emission on the zero photon line and filter out all the other light that you don't like. And uh, that means that what you then collect is uh, a stream of Fourier limited uh, single photons. And uh, so we send that uh, uh, to uh, via fiber to the other lab, to the cavity, and uh, show that indeed we can do spectroscopy on the cavity with a molecule with a stream of uh, single photons. Uh, you can read the paper to know, uh, to see more of the details, but I just want to show that uh, the technology is really there. Uh, it is, of course, fairly, uh, uh, fairly cumbersome and complicated to run two cryostats to be able to do this experiment. 
Um, now, why we do this experiment, of course, another issue is, uh, uh, is, is how many photons end up going actually from one cryostat to the other one. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, you're interested in collecting as many of the photons as possible because uh, an average molecule is going to emit in all kinds of directions and you have a, uh, a lens and this lens has a finite collection efficiency, uh, which means that if you were to trigger your molecule, uh, you would uh, most of the time uh, not be collecting any photons uh, upon trigger, uh, but only once in a while you have a photon. So this is a typical situation for a single photon source. Uh, so when you say single photon, it doesn't really mean that you have a single photon. It means that you don't have more than a single photon, right? But uh, ideally, you would like to actually really have a single photon every, one, every time that you think you have, should have a photon. So many years ago, when we were still in Zurich, we uh, developed a, a fairly simple scheme for uh, manipulating the emission pattern of, uh, of a dipole or emitter, like a molecule or an atom or anything else. Uh, uh, so that that emission goes only in one direction and not everywhere. Uh, this is, uh, if you want a little bit of uh, uh, radiation pattern engineering uh, using uh, uh, the right indices of refraction and thicknesses and all of that. Um, and by doing this, we showed uh, a few years ago that we really can uh, get something like a single photon gun. Uh, you see here a stream of photons that have uh, uh, come out of a single molecule. And you see now exactly uh, the, uh, the rhythm at which we've triggered uh, this molecule. And uh, uh, in, in most cases, the photons are there, but you see that in this case, the photon is lost. In this case, it's lost here, it's lost twice. But in many cases, it's exactly there where you expect it. Uh, so uh, this is something that now in the next generation will be combined with our cryogenic experiments to make sure that uh, that, that whole uh, kind of machinery becomes uh, more uh, efficient. All right, uh, as a last thing for this chapter, uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, pop up a few very new results that we've just submitted. Uh, they should be on archive by the weekend uh, and uh, where we take the same system and show that we can actually enter the strong coupling regime before we were just outside the strong coupling. And uh, so the signal looks quite similar as before, except that now you have a proper uh, vacuum Rabi uh, splitting. And uh, we can uh, confirm that by going to the time domain and really see an oscillation on the uh, decay of the uh, cavity. And when we do that, uh, we now have access to very strong nonlinearities. Uh, if you were to increase the uh, the incident, the, the power in the incident beam, of course, you see that you can uh, saturate the molecule. That's, uh, that's very straightforward, except that now our saturation happens with uh, something of the order of one photon per cavity lifetime. So you can saturate this uh, molecule with extremely weak light, essentially, if you only have one single photon. Um, and uh, we've also demonstrated that you can do switching now, you can do optical switching, uh, again, with only one photon. In this experiment, we're sending two beams. Uh, one beam is uh, our probe, and the other beam is going to be acting like a pump, uh, or if you want, a gate and a signal. Uh, we call it a pump, but actually this pump is extremely weak, and we can show that with, again, uh, uh, one pump photon, uh, per cavity lifetime, we can uh, 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 turn the uh, uh, probe beam completely on. So to begin, the probe beam is not going through because it's resonant with our system. And uh, when we introduce uh, uh, a one photon, which is 300 megahertz detuned uh, into the cavity, uh, the probe uh, leaks uh, almost perfectly. All right, so uh, I've shown you that uh, you can take a molecule and uh, put it in a cavity. You can be in the weak coupling regime or in the strong coupling regime. And uh, in all these cases, 
uh, you have uh, an interference phenomenon or a resonance phenomenon in the cavity that leads to a change of the density of states and, uh, and that uh, uh, changes the radiation properties of the molecule that you have in there. And uh, I understand uh, there's supposed to be an ice cream break. Uh, so I stop here and uh, if there are questions, uh, I can, we can discuss. And uh, in the next uh, half, I would like to show you that similar concepts can be uh, applied also to plasmonic nanoactive. Well, thank you very much, Fahid, for the really interesting talk so far. Um, we have quite a number of, of questions. Um, so let me sort of start um, with this. So, so when you look at sort of the, the decoherence for your two-level systems coupled to their environment, it, to what extent is there a focus in your research area on finding an environment where these are close to a theorist two-level system? So things like your single photon gun. And to what extent are the imperfections actually a focus of the study? That is, that you can use the two-level system uh, as a spectroscopic probe of the properties of the, of the materials or molecules. Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, in the past, in the past 20 years or so, uh, we've really tried to, uh, to, we've tried to dodge um, anything that um, makes our molecule um, be less efficient. So uh, we have chosen uh, the combination of the molecule and the matrix very carefully to have as much of the uh, signal to come on the zero phonon line and for this cross section to be as large as possible. But uh, basically having shown that we can do everything now, uh, the next step uh, uh, becomes a little more technological, uh, but from a fundamental point of view, uh, uh, we're actually turning our attention exactly to the other uh, possibility, uh, namely uh, understanding uh, all those decoherence channels, uh, which uh, you can call that decoherence, but you can also call that transitions to vibrations. And vibrations in a molecule are actually uh, extremely, uh, they, they, they offer a very rich platform because you have all kinds of levels. These are quantized levels of the nuclear motion of the molecule. And uh, if I have time at the very end, I'll show you how we're actually trying to uh, uh, explore uh, the interaction of a molecule uh, with uh, a more mechanical degrees of freedom of uh, its environment uh, 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 and, and hoping that we can actually use these uh, degrees of freedom as a quantum resource. So that, that, that sounds very interesting. Um, uh, on the sort of two level system side, um, can you then in that sense from your work um, sort of produce, if you like, a list of basic requirements or basic principles that you use to, to turn a complex molecule into sort of a perfect two level system or perfect emitter? Uh, the numbers just have to make sense, right? I mean, you, you have a certain enhancement factor and the question is, how far are you from that? I mean, we started with a situation that is not too bad. Uh, so we had a 30% branching ratio and we had a cross section that was, we, we were getting extinction dips of the order of 10% in one uh, single pass kind of focus experiment. Uh, so uh, if you're in a situation like that, it doesn't take a lot of enhancement to turn 10% into something like 99%. Uh, but uh, if you take something like an NV center, uh, the zero phonon line is quite weak. And uh, uh, so you need a stronger enhancement uh, to get there. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, and this is something that I would like to emphasize at the very end of the talk, is that uh, you're, you're not limited by concepts, you're limited by your materials. Uh, you have to have a combination of a certain material with a certain resonator. And quite often the bottleneck is, how do I bring these two together so that uh, my resonator Q doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, get bad and uh, I have enough enhancement to do what I want to do. So in that way, I can't give you a, a recipe. I would say that uh, uh, each material and each molecule uh, has its own, let's say, story, but it's very easy to know uh, what kind of enhancement factor you need 
uh, to get there because you're just basically comparing the one rate with uh, another rate and uh, you just want to increase the one rate to the point that it dominates. Mm -hmm. so, so actually, um, that, that's interesting. We, have, we had a couple of questions actually about the, the cavities specifically. So um, maybe let me ask you, um, what, what tends to limit the finesse of the, um, of the, the resonators that we use? Is it surface roughness um, or are there other physical properties that are limiting the, the finesse of the cavities? Um, at this point, we are right now not limited by the surface roughness. Uh, uh, we are limited by some residual mechanical instabilities. So uh, I have to say that you know the the, the resonator that we used was uh, was something that was supposed to be a dummy resonator. Uh, we uh, it, it was a trial thing that we were testing, uh, but it worked so well that. Uh, we ended up working with it for several years now. Um, so now we've taken it out and we're going to the next generation try to uh, improve the resonator. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there are a number of things that you can improve to, uh, uh, to get more stability. Of course, this, this resonator is locked, right? Uh, and uh, the quality of the lock depends on the quality of your mechanical stiffness and, and all of that. Uh, so that has to be revisited. In our case, I would think that that's where we gain uh, the most obvious uh, factor next. Uh, at some point, of course, you could be limited by, uh, by your roughness, but uh, the roughness, the way we make these things, uh, uh, it, it, these, these resonators are really hamstrung smooth. Mm -hmm. um, can you combine these things potentially with photonic crystal cavities? Do you mean the molecules? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, again, I mean, in principle, of course, the answer should be yes, but in practice, uh, the answer is it's very difficult because, uh, I mean, that's one of the difficulties of photonic crystals from their uh, original birth, that uh, you always need a large index contrast between the two parts of the photonic crystal, let's say holes and, and, and not holes and the dielectric, uh, to get a large Q or to get any kind of a proper band gap. And uh, so everyone else who's done a photonic crystal has basically made a photonic crystal out of the material. So if you look at uh, uh, gallium arsenide type of people or diamond people, uh, they're making their photonic crystal out of the same material. But uh, to put something on something else is by definition somewhat uh, precarious. Uh, but you know, again, depending on in which regime you want to be, uh, it's not uh, it's not impossible, but I would say that if you were to think about a photonic crystal that you've made out of one material and now you want to put molecules on it, uh, because these molecules want to be in this organic crystal, um, you would have to somehow put the organic crystal there. But the index of refraction of the organic crystal is not large enough. It's only about 1.6 to 1.8. Uh, and making a photonic crystal out of this organic crystal is, uh, is not so obvious. Um, so I think in the interest of time, um, we should let you uh, move on to the, um, to the last part of the talk. Um, but we have lots of other questions and we'll um, come back to those at the end. So thanks. Sure, absolutely. All right. Uh, yeah, so I told you that um, I want to um, move on to now plasmonic antennas. I did emphasize here, and this is, is maybe a strange kind of slide that you see, but I'm emphasizing that basically what makes a cavity a cavity uh, is the fact that light is going back and forth and you're creating a resonance. And once you have a resonance, you change the density of states. But uh, actually, if you think about your atom, uh, an atom is also a cavity or you don't, it's not really a cavity in the sense that it, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a wavelength size object in which you can trap a photon, but you do have a resonance. Uh, and uh, we like to think of something like an atom more like an antenna. And uh, so uh, the field of plasmonic antennas has been uh, quite active. Uh, um, it was born less than 20 years ago, but in the meantime, it's quite uh, well established. And uh, so the idea is that if you have something as simple as a uh, gold nanoparticle, uh, because the dielectric function of gold is what it is, 
uh, it leads to a plasmon resonance. Uh, and uh, this resonance is uh, essentially what uh, leads to uh, field enhancement. Uh, and you can think of this as uh, charge oscillations inside this uh, particle. And uh, because the particle is smaller than wavelength of light, you can think of this as mainly a dipolar oscillation. Uh, so if you were to replace now the gold particle by a dipole that you've excited, uh, that you've induced, then uh, the field lines are going to look like this. And uh, But because of the dielectric function of gold, uh, the plasmon resonance is actually quite broad. Uh, and about half of this is radiative, the other half is non-radiative. Uh, either way, one of the advantages is now that you have a very broad resonance, whereas before we were dealing with resonances that are of the order of a gigahertz, so about a thousandth of a nanometer. Here we have a resonance that is tens of nanometers broad. So if you want to do any type of broadband work, uh, plasmonic antennas are uh, very attractive. And of course, they're also attractive because they're very small. So instead of having uh, 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 something that is several microns large, with 100 nanometers, you already have your uh, resonator. Uh, the disadvantage is that the coupling now has to be done via the near field. Uh, and, uh, and the other major advantage is that uh, 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 there are losses in the middle, uh, so uh, uh, your losses will never be uh, zero. All right, nevertheless, uh, we and many other people uh, in the world have uh, done lots of uh, experiments in which uh, uh, something like a single molecule has been coupled to uh, uh, to a plasmonic antenna. Uh, uh, we started this work uh, by showing that a very simple uh, uh, gold nanoparticle, spherical gold nanoparticle is actually a very good antenna. Uh, we put these gold particles at the end of a fiber tip and uh, used scanning probe technology to bring it and uh, uh, almost in contact with uh, a molecule, so bring them into the near field of each other and could show that uh, there was something of the order of 20 times uh, reduction of the lifetime. Uh, more recently, uh, meanwhile, several years ago, uh, uh, we uh, uh, um, replaced that spherical antenna with a conical antenna in a nanocone uh, that we again produced using uh, focused ion beam milling. You can read about that in this paper uh, and showed that uh, in this case, we could couple a quantum dot uh, this time the quantum dot is at the end of a fiber tip and could be moved very carefully close to the cone. And uh, we could show that in this case, spontaneous emission was enhanced by a factor of uh, just about uh, 100. If you uh, do your theory, uh, theoretical calculations, you show that in fact you can expect uh, enhancements of several thousand to tens of uh, thousands. So this is an interesting uh, scheme. Um, most of the work is done at uh, room temperature. These are the works that we've done there because you can look at the change of lifetime uh, even at room temperature. Um, but the work that has been done uh, has been done via fluorescence, uh, which means that, uh, again, uh, it's an incoherent process. You are uh, 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 exciting the excited state and then it decays uh, via some uh, channels. And uh, the way the molecule is detected is always via uh, the fluorescence photons. Uh, but uh, uh, it's very interesting to see whether you can do the same type of work that we've done uh, in terms of coherent interaction of uh, photons with uh, molecule and cavity, whether you could do the same thing uh, uh, with plasmonic uh, uh, antennas. And uh, as I said, you know, there have been a number of groups that have uh, pressed ahead with this. Uh, there have been uh, some works that are done at uh, room temperature with uh, different uh, geometries of plasmonic uh, antennas and uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, emitters. And these emitters could be, uh, uh, could be molecules, could be quantum dots. Um, and uh, uh, what we have done is try to uh, do this also uh, in the cryogenic domain. Uh, uh, 
and I'll tell you something about that. But before I do that, I just flash uh, some new results that we uh, are also excited about, uh, where we can show that in this type of antenna arrangement, you really can, in a controlled way, also get a single quantum dot uh, at room temperature to undergo something that looks like a uh, strong coupling. Uh, right, but this is not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about coherent effects and uh, coherent interactions. Uh, now in this arrangement, um, again, I'm coming with an incoming beam uh, and now I've coupled a molecule and a gold nanoparticle. Uh, this is as if I have a molecule in the cavity, except that now I have a molecule next to a plasmonic particle. And now the question is what happens if I look in transmission, as if I'm looking at the transmission of the uh, uh, cavity. And uh, what happens, of course, is that uh, the uh, light uh, gets scattered by the molecule, as it did before, but it also gets scattered by the gold particle. And, uh, and these two interfere in the far field. But of course, they're also undergoing near field interaction with each other. And um, uh, we showed in a theoretical paper uh, several years ago that uh, this should allow us to uh, do something like uh, dipole-induced transparency, or in a slightly different language, you could be doing cloaking. And the idea is that if you look at a focus beam and look at its profile, it would look like that. If you were to put uh, a gold antenna in there, of course, this is a this is a metallic particle. It would scatter a lot of light so that your beam profile would look like this. And what we showed theoretically was that if you now add one single uh, atom or molecule to this antenna right next to it, you would recover the beam profile that you had before, which means that if you were a detector or someone looking uh, in transmission, you would not know that there is an antenna, there is a large nanoparticle uh, in the beam because its response has now uh, interfered with the response of that molecule. And uh, you can say that the molecule has cloaked uh, this nanoparticle. So we wanted to do this experiment in the lab. And uh, what we've done is we've fabricated, nanofabricated, uh, uh, gold uh, bumps, if you want, nano bumps. Uh, these are gold particles sitting on a glass substrate. Uh, and uh, then we sprinkle molecules on them, but these molecules are actually embedded in a, in a thin crystal. And then uh, we focus our light on one of these uh, 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 gold nanoparticles. Uh, now you see kind of uh, uh, the the size ratios, our beam uh, is focused to something of the order of 250 to 300 nanometer. Uh, the particle is 100 to 150 nanometer large, uh, which means that uh, there is a certain region around it. And uh, this matrix now is just doped, which means that there is a random distribution of molecules. Typically in one focus, you would have several tens of uh, molecules that you would see. So uh, the arrangement is uh, shown uh, uh, as, as here. We use a solid immersion lens as uh, before to be able to focus very tightly onto uh, the sample. The sample, I won't go through the, to the technical details, but the sample is made in a way that you would have this array of gold particles and you would have your molecules right next to them. Um, and then uh, we have access to the light that uh, uh, is emitted via fluorescence or the light that just goes right through. Um, and as before, we're operating in a cryostat and a similar type of uh, setup. Um, so this is the typical kind of spectrum that we would record uh, from the signal that we get if you, uh, 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 or the signal that we see if we were to focus on one of these uh, gold particles. So you see here that there are many molecules that are talking to us. These are the molecules that have been excited. And uh, the signal that I'm showing you is a fluorescence signal. Uh, so you see that every time I hit a resonance, I get a gush of 
uh, photons. Uh, now, in this case, actually, uh, this uh, line was uh, much stronger. And it turns out that uh, this guy is uh, a molecule that is not just sitting there, but it's coupled to the gold nanoparticle. Whereas this guy, although has a, a respectable signal, uh, we could show that it is not coupled to the uh, gold nanoparticle. So um, uh, we can chase these guys. And uh, I have to maybe mention or emphasize that uh, many of you might have heard from some talk here and there that molecules bleach. This is something that you should uh, erase from your hard drive if you're doing this type of experiment that I'm telling you about, because these molecules do not bleach. Uh, we can work with the same molecule for a whole year if you want. Uh, the condition, the combination of a molecule in this matrix and the fact that we are in a cryostat uh, doesn't leave a room for any kind of bad photochemistry. And, uh, and therefore, these things are extremely stable. Okay, so uh, how do we know that these molecules are coupled or uncoupled? Well, we have a lot of information from them. Uh, for example, we can do microscopy on them. You see here in the background the shadow of the gold nanoparticle. Uh, this is a typical kind of extinction signal that you see if you were to uh, put a, a gold particle in your beam, in your laser beam. But uh, on top of that, we can uh, look at the fluorescence signal of the individual molecules. And then we can use uh, uh, concepts that you are probably familiar uh, uh, with from super resolution microscopy, and we can localize the centers of those. So we kind of figure out that the one molecule is sitting here and the other molecule is sitting here. In addition to that, we can uh, 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 interrogate the polarization of each of these molecules. And we know that the molecule that couples is polarized like that. So that's radial polarization compared with respect to the gold particle, and that's good. And the one that is not coupled is uh, polarized somewhat similarly, but is sitting in a way that its polarization is tangential to the gold particle, and that's not good for coupling. So uh, by following these two, we can uh, figure out what happens when uh, a molecule couples to a gold nanoparticle. Uh, and of course, we can do all the usual tests. For example, here we're looking at antibunching uh, measurement from uh, the molecules. This is the uncoupled molecule, has a typical lifetime of uh, a few nanoseconds. And then uh, we uh, look at the coupled molecule and we clearly see that its lifetime is, uh, is uh, shorter. Uh, we can do saturation measurements on each one. This would be the saturation curve of the uh, uncoupled molecule, and this would be the saturation curve of the coupled molecule. Um, and uh, uh, from, the, from the coupled molecule, we're already getting uh, a lot of photons. So this is of the order of uh, 8 million counts per second that are detected on the, cam on the uh, uh, APD. Um, and uh, uh, so if you put all of these things together, we could really show that there is a uh, partial croaking or partial induced transparency. And the experiment, as I mentioned before, is like this. So we focus the light beam onto one of these uh, uh, gold particles. We look in transmission. Uh, this is the signal that we could get. Um, now, if we were to look at the uncoupled molecule, we get a dip. That's a typical kind of extinction dip that we would expect from a molecule. And remember that this dip is only a few percent uh, because uh, uh, this molecule is a multi-level system and, and, and all of that. Um, but this dip we're seeing on top of the extinction signal of the gold nanoparticle. So the baseline that I have here is actually the light that has gotten through after the gold nanoparticle. And uh, now if I look at the uh, coupled molecule, I see that I, first of all, I see a peak. Secondly, I see that my resonance is much broader. My resonance is broader because my lifetime was shorter. So that's just the Purcell effect that I'm detecting. And uh, it is now uh, uh, positive. Uh, so that, that's, that's if you want a phase effect. Uh, but what it means is that there is less light extinguished because there is one molecule 
uh, in the way as compared to before where there was no uh, monarchy. All right, so uh, uh, we thought that we, we, we've demonstrated that. And now for the very last uh, part, I want to give you a glimpse of where we are going. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, uh, we have the coupling of light to individual molecules under control. We can enhance them, we can manipulate them, uh, interrogate them. But uh, uh, I think an exciting future is going to be in uh, multi-emitter, multi-photon systems. Uh, you can think of this as something like a quantum network, but uh, even for its own sake, uh, if you can manage to uh, build a well-defined controlled uh, quantum system that is highly uh, uh, entangled or highly coupled, uh, this would be very interesting. So how can we get many molecules to talk to each other via uh, photons in an efficient uh, way? Uh, where we think that uh, we've, we've actually demonstrated that you can do uh, two of these guys, uh, uh, not super efficiently, but we've demonstrated that. Uh, but in order to really do many, we think that you absolutely need to go to a chip circuitry and to a one-dimensional type of uh, geometry. Uh, so the uh, geometry that we have is uh, uh, depicted here. We're going to have a waveguide. Now imagine that you have lots of molecules that are coupled to the same mode of the waveguide. Uh, we've done this uh, theoretical calculation, which shows that the system could be extremely rich and interesting, depending on uh, the distances and positions of these molecules and the densities of them. Uh, you can get all kinds of different regimes. You might come across Bragg scattering, uh, but you might also come across uh, light localization. The way we're uh, exploring these things uh, from an experimental point of view is, uh, as you would expect, uh, we try to build uh, or fabricate uh, uh, waveguides on a chip. Uh, typically, we have a glass uh, chip, and on that, for example, in this case, we have a titanium dioxide uh, sub-wavelength waveguide. Uh, we can integrate uh, gratings to couple light in and couple light out. And then uh, by putting uh, our matrix on top of this, uh, we uh, 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 allow some molecules to be so close that uh, couple evanescently to the mode. And uh, so if you were to uh, read the, uh, the transmitted light, uh, you would easily see lots of dips in it, and these dips are uh, uh, essentially coming from individual molecules along the uh, path of the photon that went uh, through. Um, we can uh, make this a little more complicated, try to go towards that resonator. I, uh, you see here that the problem of the dip is the same problem as before. We're not going to get 100% dips. And to get to that 100% dip, again, we need to do some enhancement. And uh, in this case, we've uh, shown the first, uh, uh, the first results uh, show that we can do something like that by making ring resonators uh, on a chip. Uh, so you can couple light in, the light comes here, goes through the resonator, can get coupled out here, or get coupled out here. Um, so this is a, a transmission uh, measurement through the resonator. For example, if you were to look here, uh, you see that the resonator has a line width of about um, uh, 20, 30 uh, uh, gigahertz, but uh, superposed on that, you also see lots of, uh, lots of uh, sharp lines, and those are uh, dips that we see from individual molecules that are coupled to this uh, resonator. And if you zoom onto that, you see that uh, we have a kind of a respectable signal of about uh, 20%. Uh, but uh, we want this to be uh, uh, going to, uh, towards 100%. And there, uh, we are limited right now by the quality of the uh, resonators and, uh, and overall samples that we make. So we're working on that. And uh, we hope that uh, we can soon uh, improve this by quite a bit. Uh, one of the things that you can do, you can explore other materials. So this is, for example, uh, exploring gallium phosphide instead of titanium dioxide. These are all things that are quite exploratory. Um, this is a work that we did in collaboration with a group of Paul Zeidler at IBM in Zurich. 
Um, gallium phosphide has a great advantage in principle that it has a large index of refraction and therefore it confines light more strongly. And uh, uh, this index contrast means that uh, we get larger, uh, larger dips from individual molecules. Uh, in this work that we was just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, we actually ended up using molecules as sensors. So this is one of the questions that maybe uh, was asked earlier. Here we're using molecules as a sensor to detect uh, charge fluctuations in calcium phosphate. It turns out that uh, uh, there are some residual small charge fluctuations, and uh, these charge fluctuations result in, uh, in a stark effect uh, that we uh, can detect, and uh, again, I won't go uh, into details of that because I'm already over over time. But you can consult this paper and see uh, what we're doing there. And uh, finally, I wanted to uh, flash this work that is on archive. It's a theoretical work where uh, we're um, uh, uh, showing that you can take a molecule and uh, and turn it into a, a hybrid system uh, by coupling it to uh, engineered uh, phononic environments. And the idea is that, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the vibrational lines of the molecule uh, in the solid state live only a few picoseconds. Uh, so uh, there are lots of things that you might imagine doing to make those picoseconds longer. Uh, but uh, they are extremely short right now. And one of the things that uh, we've done in this work is to devise a uh, geometry in which a molecule couples to external mechanical modes of a nanocrystal that is then coupled to a phononic crystal and all of that. And uh, it, it looks like that way we should be able to get uh, access to vibrational states that are uh, that live as long as a millisecond. This is very important because uh, the one downfall of uh, downside of uh, this type of molecule that I've been talking about is that uh, there is no spin in the ground state, <clears throat> which means that the only long-lived state that we have is the ground-ground state. And uh, uh, this type of approach will probably give us access to other long-lived uh, states that we can use uh, uh, for uh, memory, but also lots of other uh, tricks like population transfer and, uh, and, and, and that kind of stuff. And I think with that, I uh, just uh, uh, advertise a little uh, mini review that I, uh, or, or I don't know what they call that, some kind of a visionary thing that I wrote in nano letters. I emphasize that because uh, I think at the end of the day, I argue in this work that there are lots of amazingly uh, uh, nice things that you can do conceptually, but it really comes down to whether you can uh, you can manage your material uh, or not. Uh, so I think uh, the bottleneck is no longer in photonics or nanophotonics. This was the case when we started 20 years ago, but I think most of the issues are now essentially technological issues. Uh, we understand what we're doing, but we need very good materials to be able to uh, do uh, good uh, quantum optics. So with that, I stop and I apologize for going over by a few minutes and look forward to some questions, maybe. Great. Well, thank you very much, Fahid, for the, the really fascinating talk. Uh, There's a really interesting system so with such a broad range of applications. Um, this was really, really fascinating, as I say. So thank you for that. Um, we have quite a few questions, um, but not a lot of time. Um, so what I think we might do is for, for many of them, we'll send you an email. And uh, if you're willing, it would be great to get some, uh, some answers. And so apologies to people uh, whose questions we don't get to. Let me just ask you sort of briefly about, about one sort of uh, sort of potential future direction. Um, we had a question uh, when you're talking about coherence and decoherence, whether it's possible uh, in these systems to obtain indistinguishable photons from a molecule. Uh, and if you couple it to a plasmonic antenna of the sort you're showing us, um, whether indistinguishable photons might be generated at room temperature in these systems. Um, so, so the paper, that is listed here actually reported indistinguishable photons from uh, from these molecules. 
Uh, this was actually not even the first time that someone had shown that there were, you can get indistinguishable photons from a molecule. Uh, in this work, we showed for the first time that we can actually get indistinguishable photons from two individual molecules at large distance and, uh, and uh, uh, did a hongu mandel experiment with those two photons coming from two molecules. Um, so yes, you can do that. I mean, the emission of the molecules are Fourier limited. Uh, so it's very simple to uh, actually get indistinguishable uh, photons from them. Uh, now, uh, there, there is a, I think in the quantum, uh, quantum dot community, uh, uh, people have become interested in uh, going beyond proof of principle type of demonstrations and making devices that you can sell. Uh, if you operate at that level, then... Uh, uh, then you know you might uh, argue that if you have an anti-punching that goes down to uh, uh, to three percent, it's not good enough. Uh, at that level, we have never really tried to uh, uh, explore how pure this whole thing would be. But uh, within reason of only having a couple of percent uh, background, uh, we do this routinely. Well, thank you very much again for the, the really interesting talk. Um, and I'll, um, I'll pass back now to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also uh, from my side, Bai, for a very interesting talk. Uh, let me summarize, uh, sum up and say that next week on May 13th, we will have yet another interesting talk, we think, by Eric Hudson, who will talk about the thorium nuclear clock and progress towards that. Uh, you should also check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they will have Martin Centurion, who will speak about ultrafast dynamics. If you want to get notified about what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com, subscribe to our email list and our Google Calendar, and you can follow us on Twitter as well. Thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye.